is conservation tillage? Well, it's an umbrella term for a lot of a lot of different different things, uh, but it's reducing as many trips as possible to accomplish the same results or equal yields. And that's one thing I caution people about is don't go at this to increase yield. Uh, basically, through the years, we're talking about equal yields. We've seen some increase in yields, and I'm not going to say you won't experience that. But I think transitioning into this, we don't want to lose any yields. Uh, the other thing that he puts in his definition is leaving as much residue as possible and learning how to manage that residue. And I think that's something that, that we, all, we all have fear because we all look at clean till fields. And that's the way I was brought up. I was brought up with a real hard work ethic like you on the farm that the more you work and the harder you work, the more successful you're going to be. Well, I think we've all learned it's, more, it's better to farm smart and lower our input costs. Uh, I think sometimes when we go into this, we think about why should we change? Why have we tilled? And examine why we've really tilled. And it's, it's to, to uh, build a seed bed, a good, firm, clean seed bed. Well, maybe the seed bed that you prepared last year that you tear down and try to rebuild was as good as uh, the one you're going to rebuild this year. So maybe you have a firm seed bed. And then we used to cultivate for weeds. We cleaned our fields with mechanical cultivation. And now we have herbicides that we can do that. We have biotechnology that helps us accomplish that without the, without the tillage. We have the Roundup Ready crops. So we have to examine that. We had to incorporate fertilizer. And we're going to look today when I get into the equipment of how we can put place our fertilizer correctly without tilling up the soil. Uh, we have planters that drug through the field more or less, and now we have planters that we'll look at, as you saw today, that will uh, slice and cut and roll through this residue. Uh, the other thing is it's a system. And you saw different parts of the system. The guidance system is a system in itself, but yet it complements the other. If you have compaction, there are systems out there. So you have to evaluate the whole thing and not just look at it as a method of planting. And that's, that's what we often do. Think, well, I'm going to go put my seed in the ground and we're going to just look at it as a, as a method of planting. Again, remember as we talk about it, there's two things that you won't hear today. You won't hear a lot about increasing yield. You won't think it's pretty as far as the fields you're normally looking at. In fact, uh, it's been termed as ugly farming, high residue farming, trash farming, and it's not going to have the perception that we were all brought up with and what it's supposed to look like. It's going to look different, and that's, I think that's the hardest thing to get used to. I was talking to a farmer south of here after the, the field day down at Five Points, and he told me how many times he had cultivated his cotton since it came up. I said, why? And I wasn't being facetious. I want, you know, give me a reason, you know, to move water down the road. And we're going to talk about that. To control a weed that we don't have a herbicide at the proper rate in the proper time won't control. Give me a reason, and there are some reasons sometimes to do some tillage, but I asked him why he did it. He said, well, it just makes it look prettier when I drive by. I'm on the road and all. And there's a lot of that, and, and you're going to hear the term today uh, with Max Carter, recreational tillage. The hardest thing you will ever do as a farmer is let the tractor and the tillage equipment set. I talked to one guy today. He said, I sold all mine. Got to it's kind of like throwing a pack of cigarettes away. Uh, it's harder than quitting smoking. It's, as a farmer, it's harder than quitting drinking to quit tilling. It's the hardest thing you'll ever do in a farming operation is stop tilling the soil. We were born, we were bred, that that's what a farmer did. You still see all the pictures in the newspaper and that's what a farmer's supposed to do. He's supposed to till the soil. He's not a tiller of the soil, he's a caretaker of the soil. So if we can take care of it better by uh, not doing as much tillage and end up with the same results. I want to get into some of what our Monsanto team, and I will plug it as that because they are taking a tremendous lead here. In fact, uh, between Woodland and uh, to Larry and down, down through the valley, we started out with one 20-acre 
patch. And Vernal Gomes started with that three years ago in strictly no-till corn. In fact, he called me and he was so proud. He said he had met, he's on the dairy board and he had met somebody from Tennessee that suggested he call me and he says, uh, I started conservation tillage. I only dished my field three times and uh, planted my corn and it, it just looks beautiful. And I, right off, you know, I popped off. I said, well, why didn't you disc it three times? And I, he was so proud of himself for cutting about seven trips out, and I just shot him out of the saddle right on the beginning. So I backed up a little, and, and we started working, and I said, what kind of planter do you have? And we talked about how to change his planter and retrofit it and accomplish the same thing with, without a disc. So we started out three years ago with 20 acres. We uh, obtained a, in, in Jeff, uh, has worked with us on, a, on the planter you saw today. And by the way, that planter only was going about two miles an hour. You can plan a normal speed with that, that planter, uh, five and a half, six miles an hour. We like to keep it under that. Uh, but we uh, obtained a tractor, and you're going to hear more about that. I mean, excuse me, a planter retrofitted here uh, near Woodland, near Davis, uh, from Valley uh, Truck and Tractor. And, uh, started started working. Last year, 2,000, we had about 2,000 acres of demos, comparisons. And I think that's what you need to start it, is compare it and perform it correctly. This year, nearly 25,000 acres of no-till corn are between here and Tulare, California. Now, that's probably about, on the average, uh, what do we have? 25, 30 farmers participating in these demos. And some of them are very large demos. Uh, you'll hear Chuck Dudney talk in a minute, and he was, uh, or after lunch, and he was going to start out with about 50 or 90 acres, and he couldn't stand that. And he, I'll let him tell you how many acres he ended up with last year. So once you get into it, it's kind of as easy as falling off a log. Once you change your attitude towards it, 90 percent of the tillage mentality is an attitude between our ears. We have to change that, and obviously. You're interested in changing that or you wouldn't be here today. I want to get into the slides and I think pictures are worth thousands of words of the kind of equipment we're doing and show you some of the, the things that, that we've learned together in stock management. And one of the things you'll see here is I like to leave, manage the residue like we looked at the uh, chaff spreader and that's definite. Conservation tillage starts with the harvest of the previous crop. How you manage your residue, how you moves the grain out of the field, uh, how you track, and if it takes a, a GPS or uh, a tracking system to do that, but you'll learn not to harvest wet, you'll learn to keep your tires, as many mentioned today, between the rows and not on top. So what you're doing is letting your previous crop, the root system, once it's developed, do your, uh, your tilling for you. Once that system is there, that root system, biodegrades, has bio holes, that's, that's how the moisture is going to move, the fertility is going to move, and that's where your new root system is going. So there's a lot of different scenarios you can go into. Uh, corn on corn, and this is, uh, we'll look at the front of this planter, but you can see the stalks were not harvested, uh, not shredded, not cut. We're going in and planting corn where corn was the previous year. Uh, again, corn on corn, and this, this is a, a little bigger, so what, what, what you do when you get into conservation tillage, rather than having all the big tractors, you put your money in the two or three key things. You put it in planting equipment, you put it in spray equipment so you're timely with your sprays uh, according to the label and according to the rates, and then you put it in placing your fertilizer correctly. So you run big planters rather than huge, big tractors. You just spread it out and cover more ground more quickly. And again, that field received a burn down of Roundup. We're planting Roundup ready corn. And we had one or two applications, depending on which field it was in season. And, and that's it, one, a one pass operation at planting almost got, well, a perfect stand, a perfectly acceptable stand. So corn on corn, uh, corn on sunflowers. I mean, there's just a lot of different things you can do. And you can see there, not a lot of residue from sunflowers. Once it's overwintered, it pretty much biodegrades, but you're planting on the same bed, uh, planting the corn. And that was, I believe, what, a 60-inch bed, and we're planting two 24-inch rows on a 60-inch bed. So if this is planned, 
A lot of times you don't have to go back and move your beds and reconfigure everything if you plan ahead. And it may be you have to start out by configuring your beds. You may have a compaction problem. You need the paratel or teratel type uh, frac to fracture your soil rather than going in and, and completely disking it up. Uh, corn on oats, this is where we harvested uh, the oats for haylage or green chop as we call it or silage and then went back in with the no-till planter. Got a stand again. Wheat on corn, we even push it one mower. Uh, I know when we started with this and I said well let's try some uh, no-till wheat on the corn stalks again. I like to leave all my stubble standing. Everything flows through this planter or drill in this case so much easier if it's standing. If you lay it down it has to be cut through and moved aside so your gauge wheels run smoothly on the soil surface and you obtain the correct planting depth. And we're going to show, I'm going to show a series of, of uh, these, these pictures of this particular field how it evolves through the growing season. I'd like to credit Wayne Edwards, he's our technical person for this area. He's taken all these pictures followed it all the way through. We, all of our Monsanto people are trained. Wayne Edwards, Greg, Kim Underwood, uh, to set these planters, to get you into a system to talk to you about. So I'm not gonna dump all this on you. Run back to the east and uh, what happened to that guy? We are committed to seeing you be successful with these systems along with Jeff and, and a lot of the others that are involved in here. Uh, one thing about no-till farmers, they share, because they sure don't have any support from anybody else out here uh, to, get, to get through all this. But wheat on corn, uh, this is no-till cotton behind oats, I believe, on the right, and conventional till on the left, and the left had been replanted. Uh, it was dry, they didn't get a stand. Uh, but cotton, of course, we have the plow down law south of here, so it's, we hadn't gotten the cotton on cotton yet without some tillage. But, uh, you can go cotton on other soil, on up behind other crops uh, where we don't have the pink bowworm issue. Uh, corn on tomatoes. Uh, I, think, I think this is a great way. If you've got your 60 inch beds, you're on 24 to 30 inch rows on your corn, just go back in on tomato beds. And actually, uh, Chuck Dudney did some uh, uh, work where the tomatoes did not get harvested and managed the residue back in there. And I don't want to steal his show, but I. Just remember that. I think there is a great opportunity for transplant no-till tomatoes here. I worked with tobacco on the east quite a bit where we developed transplanters to uh, do transplant tobacco that was grown on float beds and uh, can do no-till tobacco. I think all of that technology will transfer over to any type of, of plant that you, uh, you set out or plant out there. Now, I would be the first to grant you seed tomatoes would not work through all this residue where you're planting a tomato seed less than a quarter of an inch deep. I don't think you could maintain that situation in here. But again, you may not be in this system uh, continuously, but you can save a lot of trips over the fields as you go, go through it. Minimum till rice, and we're gonna push the window even closer on that next year with no-till rice with that 16, 1560 drill. Uh, that you, you saw earlier. We experienced that in uh, Arkansas and Texas using the uh, 1560 drill to literally no-till rice. This particular machine uh, does not work in a pure no-till situation, but this is a one-pass uh, type situation for rice. So almost any, any crop will, will work this way if you, if you plan ahead. So what we're looking at, and we talked about this out there earlier, is the basics are a heavy duty two bar planter that has double disc openers. Everything has to roll and cut. Your down pressure springs again uh, up at the top and we'll have a little bit of better picture of that to hold that parallel linkage down to the soil. Your coulter in front of your double disc openers, in front of your coulter, your residue uh, mover to move that residue out of the way so those gauge wheels run firmly on the soil to keep uniform planting depth. That's the main reason for the uh, residue managers. Uh, they're not made to till the soil, although if there's some clumps or rough spots uh, out there, they can move some soil, but don't set them down to move soil. We had a, looked at an operation the other day. They were trying to run those things about two or three inches deep. 
and uh, they threw up the soil out of the soil and actually the gauge wheels were riding on the rough soil that they had torn out and the planting depth was not as deep and he, he, had, he, he didn't have a stand, he had an acceptable stand but he wasted some seed uh, because his gauge wheels were riding on the soil that had been thrown out rather than on the firm, clean surface of the soil. And then you have your covering devices which you can adjust your down pressure on in the back. Uh, also have your fertilizer attachment and this was this fertilizer wheel over here on the side uh, on the bar with the, the tube running down to it is one that we had actually been very successful with uh, coming uh, from the eastern part of the U.S. out here. We had actually worked with this system uh, where we can go much deeper and didn't work as well for us. So this year on most of them we're going uh, with the fertilizer coulter out front and to the side, about two to three inches to the side that can go up as uh, Wayne Edwards says, carriage bolt deep, and he's getting his pointer out so I can, I can point. I don't know if I can talk and point at the same time. This is the fertilizer coulter that I, that I was referring to right here, and you can run this thing about four, four and a half inches deep, and I've learned that that's where most of you want to put your starter fertilizer. Those are the same type coulters that we'll come back and side dress with. Uh, down pressure springs here. Uh, most of the time, these little ones that come on the planter, if I ordered a new planter, I would definitely put these. You can buy a retrofit. You can also buy a pneumatic system that you just turn one dial. There's about six settings on each one of those down pressure springs to put down pressure anywhere from none all the way up to 450 pounds. Occasionally, if you get into a real tough soil condition, putting the down pressure on this parallel linkage will push the tool bar up and that's when we may have to put a weight bracket on there and actually hang some suitcase or tractor weights on that. But understanding this and what does this cost? This cost about four to maximized out like this about four to five hundred dollars a row unit. On the average an eight row planter is going to run you about five thousand dollars to retrofit like this. So again this is where all your equipment is going to be rather than all that you have sitting out on your on your yard now. That may sound expensive, but I think in the scheme of things, it's, it's not that uh, expensive. This is the uh, fertilizer applicator, and you can see how deep we've been running those. And we actually saw a guy that run them a little deeper. He ran them to the, instead of the carriage bolts, he ran them to the hub. So they will get down there, so when you sub up, uh, you will have your, your fertilizer where you want it and where you need it. Uh, this is a view of the, 16, of the 1560 um, no-till drill that's been very, very successful in all parts of the country. And what makes this drill, in my opinion, so much better, it has a full three-inch gauge wheel out here. It has a 22-inch blade at a seven-degree angle. So it's not only cutting through the soil straight, it's got an angle to the side that actually cuts through the residue, opens up a furrow. This is your seed firming wheel, and this is your heavy-duty down pressure closing system. Plus this whole thing has up to, again, 450 pounds of hydraulic down pressure. It's, it's, on, uh, it's on a caddy, so you have full control of the down pressure. And it's like uh, a university uh, professor told me once he got one of these, he said it'll plant a concrete road, and if it rains, it'll come up. Uh, residue managers, these can also be used to uh, move residue if you're having problems with it irrigating. And that's one of the big perceptions that I've noticed out here is we have all this residue in between the rows from the previous crop and people think water will never run down through there. It will run. In cases where we didn't get a good spread of that residue, sometimes it will ball up and we'll have to go in and clean it out. And that may be a good, good thing to mount on a tool bar and go in and, and clean that out. This is managed residue, as we say, but really this was a little too deep. Uh, I probably would not have set those to run quite as deep as that, but we got a good stand. But really those residue managers are just made to skim, skim the soil surface. Uh, again, in standing oak stubble, get a good spread of uh, the chaff. A chaff spreader, if you don't have a modern combine like we looked at earlier, is very important. In fact, when you harvest, you need a chaff spreader on there, and they're not that expensive. Another $1,000 to $1,400 to retrofit a combine, but that's very important. 
Something I noticed today that we deal with, like this morning, if you were going to no-till, and I noticed with our planter, we were hairpinning just a tad. We had what we call a deer. We had some humidity this morning. There was some moisture dri dripping off the buildings early. You have to let that straw dry. When it's wet, at least it, it just won't cut near as well, and you kind of stick some of that straw down in there. You have to wait till about 10 o'clock, and that's not every day. That's not an everyday issue out here like it is with our high humidity. Uh, back in the southeast, but that's just a tidbit of information because I have somebody call and says, well, it's not cutting the straw, it's poking or hairpinning it down in the furrow. I say, wait till the sun burns the dew off and you can go to the field and it's going to work very, very well. So I noticed this morning that it would have been one of those days that 10 o'clock would have been better than 7 o'clock uh, to be no-tilling out there. I think this is a key. I'm not advertising. But Roundup Ready corn, uh, Roundup Ready crops are making this system complement it so well. The biggest issue uh, used to be, uh, I don't have the equipment, it won't work on my soil type, but, but pr prior to that, the issue was how do I control weeds? And we spent a lot of money with the residual herbicides over the top. Uh, sometimes they'd fail and we'd have to get uh, a cultivator out and cover up some of the weed control mistakes, that sort of thing. Cool. Pri applied starting clean, applied at the proper stages with the proper rates. Uh, we get very good weed control uh, from this system. Germination, uh, corn on corn. Uh, I mean, the, the marvelous thing about this when you first do it, you have to get out of your pickup too. You can't drive by at 40 miles an hour and see this corn coming up. You have to literally get out of the truck, walk out there and look. In the first two or three weeks is the toughest. Because it, you know, you can drive by these tick clean till fields and see that little corn and the glistening sun in the morning coming up. This you can't. You're going to have to wait about 10 days, two weeks to see that you've got a standard. Get out of the pickup truck, go out there and look. And you're going to shake your head. This is the toughest time is watching that stuff come up. But it will come up. There it is. That's when you can drive by and see it a little bit better. Uh, the residue is holding the moisture. It's not bothering a thing in the world. Let me mention one thing. Two of the biggest fears that I had when I started this system were insects and diseases. I thought that would derail the whole thing. You know what the two least problems have been? Insects and disease. Although there is one insect we have seen greater pressure with, and that's cutworms, black cutworms, at planting. We normally go ahead and put a synthetic pyrethroid down on a band or broadcast behind the planter at planting, or just as soon as we come over the top, mixed in with the Roundup. If you have a moth flight come in here, they probably will land in a high residue field uh, or a no-till field before they will a clean till field. Now, I'm not, don't, take, don't take the take-home message that you're going to have cutworms, but they're more prone to be in these high residue situations. So that's just a caution. This is uh, Roundup 21 days after application or treatment at the one quart, and that's, that's about as pretty as you want to see it. A corn field. That, by the way, that that field did irrigate with that residue in in the middle of the rows. Uh, 13 days and 41 days at one quart per acre. Clean field. No Johnson grass. No anything in that field. Looks real good. Harvest. It was clean. Two applications of Roundup. It was a clean field. And by the way, this field made equal yields to the conventional till. Uh, to me, that's, that's a clean looking field at, at harvest. Uh, going back with the wheat, I like to leave my stock standing. I like to go with the row, and if all possible, if your row width of your drill works out with the row width of your header, it's good to go the same direction. Or sometimes, if they don't match up and you don't have a tremendous bed out there, go at a little bit of an angle. But going back against those, sometimes you will have some some uh, stock problem, but that will plant and it will come up. In fact, this is a series of slides that Wayne made. Planting it, that nobody would ever dream it would come up. There it is in December. It was planted in November. It's about a month later. Uh, it's beginning to come up. You think, what's going to happen to all the stocks? Look at it. This, this is just, a, in my opinion, a beautiful series of slides. February, March, where are they? They're biodegrading. The wheat's getting ahead of them. April, May, and then at harvest. 
beautiful field of wheat that made high yields, equal yields to till fields. And all it was is one pass with the drill. I would highly recommend if you didn't have good weed control in your corn to use a burn down herbicide to clean the weeds up. Again, start clean with this system. Side dressing, uh, this is kind of the way we used to do it. We went in and furred out, put our fertilizer down, and uh, uh, went on. This was Roundup Ready corn, and I asked why we were plowing, but anyway, we're, we're going to a system like this, like I showed earlier. So the coulters, and then placing the liquid fertilizer, or you can put granular, we have tubes for granular, and uh, down rather than, than uh, destroying it. And here it is, little disturbance, minimum disturbance, cutting again through the stalks, not, dra uh, not dragging it and not furring it out if you've got enough bed there. Again, if you need to run something in the middle, uh, you may uh, want to uh, configure either a residue mover or put a, uh, what I call a shovel behind those disc openers, and I'll show you a picture of that in, in just a minute. Uh, again, a fully equipped, what I call a no-till planter, the fertilizer, and how deep we can go with that. Irrigation, that fill water, and you think, my goodness, it won't water. It does water, it's a little slower. Now, if you've got to move water fast, you may need to fur out, but I think you're gonna hamper your Roundup Ready weed control because you're gonna get another flush of weeds up. Irrigation, again, it may hit one of those little dams of residue. And I didn't say dam residue, I said dams of residue or little mini dams, I call them across there, but it will go ahead and, and water. Now you may get a situation like this and you've got the conventional with the, the nice furrowed out that's had about seven or eight trips over it. And this would be a field that you would probably want to go in with something and fur out just a little bit. Uh, again, with your residue mover type situation or your fertilizer rig with a shovel behind it. And not run it deep, just run enough to, to correct the, the water situation so it's not against the law. This is the kind of weed control we get with these Roundup Ready crops like Roundup Ready cotton. Uh, and that was no-till uh, versus uh, non-Roundup Ready, or not sprayed. The Roundup had not been sprayed to the right there. Tremendous weed control, the same thing with corn. Again to the left not needing cultivation because it's clean. It's got a furrow of water. Uh, you know, let's not disturb what we've got there. It works great. Uh, I poured it the three leaf stage and the results of that. And what, what we see, if we don't hit this again, a lot of times after irrigation, we'll get another flush of weed. So just the one quart in the corn, this is the kind of results Wayne got. And he got quite a bit of weeds at harvest, which I would say would need a post-harvest application keep weed seed and that sort of thing down. And then if you were going in there with wheat, I would hit it in the fall. So if you go uh, finish, go back in there and go another quart at the eight leaf stage, this is what it looks like in harvest. That core on canopy, uh, no weeds came up through the shade, it's, it's clean at harvest. So what you go to, rather than all that multiple pieces of equipment you've got out there, you go bigger, you go wider, and that's your pride and joy rather than that big, uh, that big ripper that you've got and those big discs and all those bearings and all those blades and all that expense. Again, I think you need what I call a mentor or a buddy, somebody that's, that's learned which culture works best, somebody that learns how deep you want to place this fertilizer. It's a lot of little things to it, but it, again, it's, it's a system. Don't look at it in just a quick way, a quick fix. It's not a quick fix. It's a, it's a system that we have to unlearn a lot of things and learn a lot of new things. And I think today's been great, Jeff, and you're to be commended on, on following through with this when sometimes it's not the most popular way to, way to do it. And I commend you for all your partnerships and working with these companies. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, John. Okay. Well, thank you. A little background, I've uh, been in farming 50-something years in uh, South Georgia on the same farm, same shade trees. And uh, we did conventional farming for 20 years. And for some reason, we looked around and decided and read a lot, and they said the soil was the number one problem for farmers. And so I looked for it, and sure enough, we found some erosion on our farms. Our soil down there tends to go in the 
Uh, we got two watersheds. These go in the Gulf of Mexico or the Atlantic Ocean. With the rivers and, and tributaries, uh, takes our dry matter, floats it up, takes it out into the roads and piles up and then goes on. Where maybe here you got topsoil coming to you. We don't. We have an organic matter of about five percent. Yeah, uh, five tenths of a percent to a half of a percent is basically what's left in conventional fields. We have over a years built some up to 2% organic matter. That seems to be a big hit. But I'm gonna run through some slides here that was captured on my farm over about a five year period. And it, uh, I think you'll realize it shows consistency maybe in production. Uh, this is a lake out on, and we grow cotton right up to the lake and it stays real clear and clean, we think. Florida's in an uproar about getting dirty water from Georgia, so we have got to do a better job sending them water. Uh, this is what happens when we do a lot of disking. It wears out the tractors, it wears out the drivers, and it wears out the disc. And this wasn't a prop, this is actually something I captured with a camera. We did a little research and we want to know how long this equipment would last. But we could pretty well tell the tractor, the years of the tractor, the years of the disc. But there's one thing that a lot of farmers down there do that we couldn't determine how the life of the cross tie drove along behind the disc. And uh, this is some of your modern day equipment that was captured there last year on the field trying to incorporate a chemical. I assume, but uh, he looked like he might have been losing the chemical with uh, something called a do-all. And he's putting so much dust in here, we thought it was smoke. That's a good example of him coming back. And uh, we have a lot of pebbles. The only thing I can see, he might have been doing is raising the pebbles up. So that's erosion one way or the other. <clears throat> this is the results of that type of farming in our area. We lose the organic matter, we lose the topsoil. It uh, makes gullies in the field and they're hard to manage with equipment. That cotton was mature when I took this a picture of the farm. I mean, there's no way for him to come out of a profitable situation when it's already open and it's cut out and that's it. Uh, this is a recreational farmer that uh, loves to hire. He loves to make a beautiful field with a disc. He irons it, so to speak. And then it comes a, maybe a three to five inch rain and it puts it down in the road ditches for the Department of Transportation to pick up and use. And then he went ahead and planted his corn and of course in, the, in June it finally gets dry and hot in South Georgia and his corn finally failed. Uh, this is something we found out about erosion. I didn't believe it. I thought my big problems was dead batteries, flat tires, and maybe wide runoff state troll, stuff like that, and overdrawing the bank. Those are problems wagons turned over. But I looked around the farm and sure enough we had fences <laughs> on the low end of our fields. They came out and tied some ribbons on that uh, designated how much soil that we we're losing from a, probably a 3% slope. When, when it rains hard, it seems to get up and float, honestly float out of the field. Uh, this is cotton stalks, cotton residue that we're fixing or did drill. We drill our cover crops immediately after the pickers over the cotton. <coughs> And you'll notice uh, the drill where the opener's wet, and it does not destroy the pipes or anything on the drill. It pushes it over, drills right through with the conventional drill. Then we uh, disc the stalks and it gives come up. We left the section there before we, uh, not disc, but rotor, rotor stalks down. And the wheat comes up through it and uh, 
This is why we like to leave it under the ground. Everything that's grown, grown and is under the ground is still benefiting our soil, we believe. Got a lot of roots, you multiply that times the number of stalks that's in an acre. You got a lot of breakdown material under the soil. If you disturb the soil, you lose that activity. <clears throat> this is what our wheat and cover crop looks like in about January on our farm. This is some uh, rye that we've uh, harvested, something like we're doing today. Uh, rye makes a, probably six tons or more of cover per acre, which we really like. Really does the best on the rye cover. Uh, they said there's no need to try to plant in that. You can't. It won't work. But with our uh, equipment, that's another thing I know today. You have some great equipment. Equipment companies are coming on board. But as John said, we have to make out with what we got. That's peanuts. You probably notice those same trees along there in the back of that field, so we're not tricking you anyway. We're planting right where we were showing we were harvesting. And this is cotton, I believe cotton, sort of okay. coming through the wheat straw. This is peanuts. That's another crop. That in Georgia, they said, you can't, it won't hit, you, you'll never, we never heard so many things we couldn't do. <laughs> but that's uh, peanuts in a good stand in uh, corn, corn litter from the previous year. And uh, the agronomists in North Carolina heard about it. Uh, our agronomists in Athens coordinated with him and had him come down and look. He didn't believe it either. I said, uh, Bobby Brock, I said, you got to believe it, you're standing on it. <laughs> so he went back and they put in a program and three years later he came back with some successful stories. And I believe I read in a peanut uh, publication that the number one peanut producer in North Carolina was in the no-till field. But they come up and they do real well, the limbs they're, they limb and peg down in the ground, and the litter seems to keep the disease off of them. And uh, we're doing research and data claiming that we have less disease on the peanuts in a convention on a no-till field. Uh, one of the things that bothers us down there is wind. We get a sand blasted from wind, you'll see later, and it takes the skin off the plants and then they're susceptible to disease. This is the peanuts after they're mature. It's something like an alf alfalfa plant. It's a legume and it has, uh, puts nitrogen in the ground. Then we invert them with a piece of equipment that's called, has two blades that runs on them, picks, runs them up a belt and then turns them upside down to dry. In about five days we harvest them and the sun's Drying. That's machine invert. Uh, the production on my farm has been better with less water. And incidentally, this is no irrigation. Uh, wildlife does real good on our farm. The gentleman on the right is standing in the middle of the, the wildlife preserve, but he doesn't realize it until the machine raises it up and the aggravates the rattlesnake. And, and of course, as you can see, the last leg of the tear was headed to the bus. But wildlife does appreciate cover. Uh, we, again, there's those two trees with that peanuts being inverted. This peanuts another year and conventionally grown, uh, no-till planted, conventional, and still back there. I can't get rid of the thing. Conventional conservation. This is conservation. You'll see the residue still uh, uh, entangled in amongst the roots, and it's still there on the ground working for you. When they thrash it, it goes back on the ground. <clears throat> this is a uh, NRCS uh, 
agronomist out of Athens that started the whole pitcher scheme. He wanted to see some results. He came down and said, well, when are you going to plant? I said, we've already planted. You mean you can plant a crop and not destroy the uh, soil or move the cone? And so he was real happy about the whole thing. <clears throat> Cotton comes up through it really well with a no-till planter that we use. It's real simple, not a lot dragging and hanging. We don't hang up and drag straw if we can help. Uh, cotton begins to grow when we get a little moisture. And uh, the straw and the residue are still there working for us. On a foggy day, it looks uh, pretty good. This is the NRCS personnel came by wanting to know exactly what it was we were growing. And uh, I said, man, can't you see, don't you know fruit and loom when you see it? <laughs> so we have a lot of fun with people come out and want to know just what it is we're doing. They tagged me the trashy farmer in my ear. And uh, I said, well, I'll accept that. I like trashy farmer. I like the guy that had the song. He liked the women a little on trashy side. So <laughs> I thought we were different anyway. But there's residue. We, we can find residue for about three years breaking down and uh, but, uh, making uh, hopefully organic or compost. We really believe it's close to composting as you can get. Uh, this is a result of cotton plants planted uh, back when it used to rain. We've had three dry years that I've ever operated in. But uh, every day of this was the year it didn't rain. And our cotton's planted double crop. So all this cotton and all this farming is double crop. We harvest the grain about last of May, 1st of June, plant cotton. It's not three bale cotton, but it's, I think the county average or state average, maybe, maybe six or 700 pounds. Uh, we have went to 1,200 pounds on the cage. The NRCS personnel came back and wanted to come back picking time. I said, be sure to come and bring a sack. We used to pick the sacks, but uh, it didn't take long before he was uh, had enough of it. We called in, brought a picker in, and he scattered more than we used to make on the field and left. But uh, you can't get it all. The wheat is uh, being cut on uh, field there and our neighbors are irrigating over on a strip on the far side and we're just getting ready to put some soybeans in the field. We did plant the soybeans. Of course the truck drives real slow or the soybeans real fast. We don't know which. The truck's still sitting there and the beans up growing. They matured and uh, I guess 45 some bushels they acre without irrigation. And it's the neighbor side, he would uh, get rid of some residue. He, like, they like to kind of like to make a bomb, see who can make the most bombs. And uh, he let the smoke up, burned off a big wheat field, right side of the road. And I just drove over to see what it was. He went to disking and I went to harvesting wheat and uh, spreading the straw back. Of course, it rained after he dissed it the second time, and his topsoil wound up again for the Department of Transportation. I, I, I was along there, and I think there was three big dump trucks out there with a backhoe loading it up. And of course, that field is one of the finer fields in the county, but uh, he failed two crops on it, and the owner put it in pine trees. So you can mess yourself up. This is a very flat, you no know, something like the land we saw in the Delta. It's real flat, but erosion will get you. It'll move when when water is coming across the soil. It picks it up and moves. It. Uh, this is floating out residue from the previous year of peanuts. He planted cotton, and there's a good example of sand erosion. We don't have a cover. And this is what I was talking about, dust and sandblasting is pretty easy. I came along the road going to my place 
and uh, <clears throat> there was my farmer's field crossing the road. Uh, I thought, well, my, you reckon he knows if it was a cow, he'd be out hunting. Yeah. But his, his, his field's up moving, and uh, I started to blow the horn and see if I could find him. But there's the results after you leave the wind damage is about like water damage. After, a, I think, about a six inch rain, this is the water coming down a drain or a creek or a watershed out of a conventionally tilled area. In the same minutes, within two or three minutes, I drive down to the end of my wheat field and you can see pretty clear water reflections of the post. And, and uh, at one point, it was going over the paved road and uh, about six inches deep, it's clear enough see the yellow lines and the way I do it is leave the leave the disc part <laughs> it's good for growing weeds <laughs> and then every time I pull it when I'm doing conventional when I pull the disc I, I brought the weeds up and got fresh germination this is a cover crop, not a very good picture. Uh, it's looking out my back field across the lake. Uh, green cover crop, you cannot, I cannot, South Georgia cannot do this successfully without a cover crop. Uh, covering the land is, is equal. I see a lot of bald-headed farmers put a hat, up, hat on, go out and hire up the field. There ought to be a message there somewhere if it's not good for your head, <laughs> you get in trouble in your field. Same way, he'll, he'll give the wife order to go down to the, in our area we use pine straw for mulch and flour. Bring a load of pine straw and put it around the flowers and let the yard look better and he's out there burning and hair in his field. Uh, that's called slow learning. We have a lot of that, slow learning. Remember that. Uh, we just had a shot of the cover crop at the back. There it is in cotton. Planted, sprayed, and went and watched Oprah shoot. You got a lot more free time. It's a lot cheaper. And uh, wildlife again loves to be in the cover. That was a, nothing more than a duck we caught traveling to the lake. Uh, Deers are prevalent on cover crops. They have some reason to be out there versus the plowed field. Won't ever see it. Quail never walk in the plowed field. They're a covey. You probably can't locate them, but we got, was able to photograph a covey of quail before they left the scene. And uh, this provides cover for them. They'll feed on insects or whatever's out there, of course we get the, get the dog out and do the little quail hunt. It's a haven for wildlife. These are two of the older persons of wildlife on my farm. I think they're the only thing out there that's older than that. A couple of gophers. Uh, more deer running than soybeans. This soybeans planted lake still looks pretty good. Uh, we do a lot of pine trees in South Georgia, makes cover and preserves the soil for future generations. If we need it, we'll be hunting it uh, two or three generations probably from now. <clears throat> Longleaf pine has disappeared. The government has programmed to try to bring them back. Uh, that's an area there of them coming up side that fence where we quit herring or disking and nature will bring them back. Uh, this is as simple as planter, something that came down the line many years ago. I was able to get a hold of it and that started my program. And then uh, Roundup Ready came along and it's hardly an excuse to be a failure in conservation tips with equipment that we saw today and the chemicals available. If you want to do it, you can. It's got to get, uh, got to mentally get ready. Field days are important. That's where we have outreach programs. And then I guess in our county, 
uh, has started from 200 acres on my farm to now I think it's about 65,000 acres. The last two years it's went over in other counties <clears throat> and they have uh, really appreciated some other way since the fuel prices has caused. Uh, it does rain, we get floods, lakes runs over, but that's clear enough what my fertility program doesn't change if I got a cover crop. This is the field where we're going to plant peanuts and that lake, that is the road down the side of the lake and it's up in the fields. But when the water goes down, uh, spring comes out the cover crop still uh, keeping the soil intact. This is a field on the left that was grazed to cover. Field on the right, we're going to cut the right. We'll show you the comparison. Uh, that's the planted cotton planted germinated in the cover where the cows graze. You see the last year's cotton stalks shining or sticking up. Then uh, the cotton that grows and the more cover you got, the better. In our situation, we love to keep the cover intact and not move. Air Force had something called no, no fly zone, and I came up, I thought we ought to have a no fly zone. Again, that's a, that's a different year, but the same location, showing you the cotton progress through cover. <clears throat> this is beginning to defoliate. Uh, the residue is still out there. Incidentally, if you do a lot of good tillage, it doesn't matter if your corn's eight foot high. When you get dump a lot of rain in our area, it hits the ground and the soil's still moving to the end of the road or the low end of the field. So, all right, this is the rye field on the right that we were going to harvest and came back and planted it. There's a little fence, electrode there was where the fence was. So that's that's not fake. That happened in that rye field planting second week in June. And uh, we were kicking around two bells today. I know this is boring you know, all this cotton, but I'm going to run around through here. It is just show you the different years, and it's consistent. Now we're getting into some dry years. Uh, last two years, it didn't hardly rain in South Tork. I was looking towards the front door. Uh, well, we got to plant peanuts again. We burned down there and show you the difference in the, where it burns down and where we didn't. It doesn't really make a difference. We're going to plant on both sides of that and burn down after we plant. Uh, that's where it is when it's merging. The old cotton stalk is still visible. Again, we got no plow peanuts, and that's the end of the road where that water was, came up on that lake out into the field. Our soil is there, fertility is there, and our peanuts are there. That's about as good a production as you'll ever turn up. We don't think ugly farming drops for yields. Corn is easy to do. That's corn in, in winter weeds. Spray them and you plant corn. They're now planting corn in uh, rye cover by burning it down early. People get some equipment a lot newer than mine, but they pattern it after the same manufacturer and the same tile, no till. These boys bought them six row and went and planted peanuts in real dry soil. Didn't think it ever mount anything. Your daddy says, well, we won't have to harvest that field. I said, well, we'll know maybe by September. So I just happened back along and sure enough, they were out there harvesting peanuts. And that tank was filled Right across there, the same light pole over the top of that arm, same location. And uh, he had to turn off to get out there in the road. His tank was full. Again, here, that one of the neighbor's fields up and moving. I understand coming up here, y'all have earthquakes or something to move soil. We have wind that moves it. But he went in and planted tobacco. That's transplanted there conventionally on beds, and the wind gets into it and it, it destroys it. That could have been prevented. This is two years ago. It was real dry. That the wheat was hard, and this farmer had some really nice equipment. First time I've ever seen dust 
buying a no-till plant. But it came up and did real well for them. This is, a, a, I believe, about a 600 circle with overhead pivots. This guy had been the one that made He was a champion bomb maker. He loved to light the biggest fire in the county. We got him to sit still one year and we got him to plant in it. And he, every, he could see me 50 yards away and say, oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> That's no till with uh, the planter moving very little residue. That's as good as you can get. The germinator came up and the straw still sticking up in this pipe. That's the same field looking the same direction. Got soybeans on the far side. So he was a happy cow. Didn't have to work at it, didn't have to burn, didn't have to chisel, didn't have to pack, and harvested his kind. We're making residue here. That's a uh, rye cover. It's the heaviest cover we get. That's what it looks like after it's been harvested. And then we're planting in it. And uh, this July the 4th, I believe last year, we didn't get enough rain to get planted on time. But then we finally got it going. Got it in and made some time. That's our county extension on the right. And incidentally, he was, uh, he said, we'll never do it in our county. Soil's too easy to plow. And now he's probably the biggest uh, promotion for no-till that we got. Making residue again another year. It looks the same. We're growing our compost. This is cotton that's sprayed after weeds have really tucked it over. In case you can, uh, you can make it work. But I never believe that the people that saw it said you never clean that. It's trash as I ever seen it. Well, we cleaned it out. And then it, this is the yield on the same year. I believe that's maybe last year for last. It looks like cotton. And this is a as soon as the piggers are through, we're in there with our conventional drill. It's already been along there and we're waiting for them to move to put our cover crop in in about uh, some, something after like Thanksgiving. Here's a no-deal drill that we're putting in a compaction, a real compacted pasture where the cows is great. And we were drilling in some uh, winter cover. Gonna see if it worked or enough, it came up. Could have hired and filled and drilled and finally got germination. But uh, we did it the easy way. That's what it looks like in a cotton field after you've uh, pulled a drill, conventional drill incidentally, through standing cotton stock. Uh, this little fellow here is gonna need some help. Get about three generations from him. We'll appreciate anything probably you can do to improve soil. Thank you very much. Any questions?